Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in the second part of week 10 of the Ramesh Sunni Balwani Theranos trial. As a reminder, Balwani is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranos. First name is Ramesh, last name is Balwani. Most people call me Sunny. I knew this mission and what the company was trying to do uh, was paramount. Uh, so I ended up giving a $13 million personal loan. Do you have any qualifications in the lab testing business? He did not. Or in pathology or anything like that? Not to my knowledge. We have been working uh, hard uh, to build something which we think is uh, magical. There were a couple of pre-jury discussions by the lawyers in front of Judge de Villa. The first was in respect of the LIS, that is the Theranos database and the initial stand for Laboratory Information System. This was apparently quite large and contained the results of all the testing that the company had done. This therefore would have allegedly contained the failure rate of the company's tests. Now the prosecution said in the Holmes trial that the failure rate of the company's tests was approximately 51.3%, which is astonishingly bad in its own right, but I'm unclear where they got that particular fact from. Now if you hadn't heard this issue, the story goes that, essentially in the closing days of Theranos when the government were collating evidence, they asked for a copy of the database to be sent to them. This was duly done. However, it was encrypted. By the time the government realised this and asked for the decryption key, it was effectively forever lost, and so no one since has been able to gain access to the data. Assistant US Attorney John Bostick said in the Holmes trial, Before Theranos took the actions to decommission the LIS, evidence on the record shows that Theranos employees knew that shutting down the database would likely be a permanent move. They went for it anyhow. Now, Bawani has maintained that the database would contain data showing that there was a very high success rate in the years that Theranos were doing their tests, and therefore the errors pointed out by the prosecution should be seen as isolated exceptions and not the norm. Now, to be honest, he could claim anything knowing that the database is inaccessible. Defence lawyers at one point did hint that there was some calculation on behalf of the government not requesting or obtaining the decryption key in a timely manner and this was somehow deliberate on behalf of the government to harm Balwani's case. The judge would have none of this line of argument, so we'll have to wait and see what, if anything, is brought up in respect of the LIS in due course. Oh, the dreaded C word was used in court. Well, yes, apparently one of the witnesses turned positive for COVID-19, so can't be brought into court on Friday, and the government had to change the order of their witnesses. We then got to the continuation of the testimony of Dan Mosley. As we've already heard, he had introduced a number of high-profile investors with high-value investments to Theranos. We had the cross-examination by the defence. He'd already said under examination, some of them met her through me, but that was the extent of my role. Speaking about Elizabeth Holmes. Oh dear. Under cross-examination, he was shown a memo he drafted for Henry Kissinger in which he said that the Theranos deal with Walgreens was brilliant, but it would be helpful to get more details. He did not, in quotes, encourage them to invest, he said. Oh dear, yet another email, this one from October 2014, and this showed where he said he trusted Holmes, and if he didn't, then he wouldn't be recommending clients invest. This was quite serious for him. He was told by Balwani's counsel that he'd took an oath to tell the truth. He'd already testified that he was told that Theranos could do all the tests. Oh dear. The defence showed him that in a prior deposition, he said that he was told it could not do all the tests. His credibility does seem to be being punished by the defence counsel, and as one observer put it, this guy is in denial about his role in the whole thing. Under re-cross examination, he says that his meeting with Holmes and Balwani did contribute to his decision to invest. And he wrapped up by saying, 
Obviously, this wasn't a good choice of word, but I'm a lawyer and not an investment advisor and would not recommend an investment. We then had another investor, Alan Eisenman. His testimony was covered here in the Holmes trial and was feisty to say the least. There was not much difference in his testimony and cross-examination to the Holmes trial, which can be summarised as follows. He invested around one million in Theranos. He relied on Holmes and Balwani for information. He was impressed with the board. He was impressed with the big pharma connections. He was told Theranos tests were flawless, like a 747 taking off, he said. Projections of $200 million in revenues were far from the mark. He was also told that Theranos would be cash flow positive by around 2010 and put in another $100,000 as a result. However, Theranos' own internal forecasts show that they expected the first substantial revenues in 2016, about eight years after Eisenman expected it. By the way, this is the best picture I could find of Eisenman, and it's from November 2021 during the Holmes trial. If anyone has a link or can point to me in the direction of a better pick, I'd be grateful and will include it in a subsequent trial update. Eisenman told the court that he was frustrated with a lack of updates and knowledge about his investment, and Theranos at one point asked Balwani to liquidate his investment. Apparently Balwani went from cordial to decidedly cold at some point. In the Holmes trial, he made the point that he was cheated to and lied to by Holmes. Eisenman had sent an email to Balwani directly with the heading, Please Respond. Balwani, ever the master of tact and diplomacy, responded. Now, I can't do any better than show the email that Eisenman received back and read it out. Alan, your emails are insulting full of inaccurate statements and wasteful of our time. Our next response to this email and all your future emails will come from our counsel. And that was it, he didn't even sign off the email. Unfortunately for Eisenman, he'd been offered to be bought out by the company a couple of times, and at one point the offer was such that he would have made a 25 to 30 million profit. Unfortunately for him, he said he thought the opportunity was a false offer and didn't take it up. Later that year, after the cascade of negative publicity was unleashed, no one would buy his Theranos shares. Chris Lucas. So we get to Friday and we have Chris Lucas take the stand. His testimony in the Holmes trial can be seen here. We heard how Holmes made claims about the technology that turned out not to be true, like their analyzers were endorsed by Big Pharma and could do all commercially available tests and were used by the military. Even though he didn't have all the usual information he would require to invest, we had another case of investing because, well, let's quote him. It was because of the Walgreens deal and my relationship with Elizabeth. I believed she was earnest, truthful in what she wanted to accomplish. Hmm. He doesn't remember speaking to or meeting Balwani, however, and even though there was an email chain to which Balwani and Lucas were included, he still didn't remember him. On cross-examination, he does say that he knew that Holmes and Balwani were dating before his 2013 investment. One of the very few people who did, it seems. Also, the defence asked him if he knew that Balwani lent the company around $12 million in the recession in 2009, and the company, and hence Lucas's investment, would have disappeared if it wasn't for Balwani. The judge didn't allow this question to be answered after objections. Reading some text out from the share sale agreement with him, it says that the investment is highly speculative and has risks. Lucas agrees and says the Walgreens deal took some risks out. Well, that's it from me for this week. If you've liked the series so far, then please hit the like button. And if you subscribe, then hit the notification bell. You won't miss out on any future episodes. Bye for now.